All right, let's take a look at the circular flow of income model, which you will see will give you an incredibly expansive understanding of what goes on inside a macroeconomic place, right? Or what we call country. So an image to set up for you to begin with, like, listen, imagine us looking down with an aerial view down on the country where you live. So I live in Chile. So imagine if I'm up above and I'm looking down at the country of Chile, what the circular flow model of income is going to do is basically give me a, a really accurate way of trying to figure out how all of this complex economic activity sort of adds up. So just imagine looking down on your country and you see like, you know, people getting cabs and people buying carrots and people buying, you know, paying tuitions at schools and people like buying airline tickets and people selling things and all this economic activity going on. It's like, whoa, you know, how am I going to make sense of this? Well, the circular flow model is a genius economic tool model for us to understand the overarching, overall big picture idea of what goes on in a macroeconomic economy, economy. Okay. So it's super important that you understand this because this is like the aerial view, big picture stuff that will enable you to understand the rest of what happens in macroeconomics. Okay, so take a look at this um, circular flow model right here. And this was done by Jason Welker, who is a teacher and author of several review books. And it's excellent because it's comprehensive, okay? But to start off with, what I want you to realize is that like, this is human behavior and we all behave in a certain way and we can all understand human behavior better by understanding stories. So I'm gonna go through this circular flow model and I'm going to like do it in a way that I think is the best for understanding economics. It's just like, you know, tell you a little story along with it. Okay. So I am a teacher at an international school here in Santiago, Chile. I teach IB economics. And basically, if you think about it, where do I start off every day? Well, I start off in my bed. <laughs> I get up in the morning in my house, right? And what do I do? I go to work. What's the workplace I call? Well, it's a firm, right? A firm is a place, a name for a company or a nonprofit organization where I, somebody works, okay? So to understand this in a very simplistic way from the beginning, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ignore the banking sector, we're gonna ignore the government sector, and we're gonna ignore the foreign sector, okay? And what we're basically just gonna talk about is what happens when somebody gets up in the morning, they go to work, they get paid, they then take that money, Right? They go somewhere else and buy something and then they go home. Okay? So just imagine for a second, you know, I wake up in the morning in my household and I'm a teacher. So I get in my van and I drive where? To where I work. Right? And where is it that I work? Oh, I want that to be blue. Where is it that I work? I work at an international school. Okay? So I go there, I work all day. And just imagine the head of school standing outside the, the gate of the school every day, handing me my pay, right? Handing me my wage. Why is he paying me a wage? He's paying me a wage because in reality, I am a factor of production for that school, right? I am land, labor, remember what they are, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. I am labor for that school. So they must therefore pay me a wage. And that wage, I'm gonna make it green, is my money that I then take home as my wage, right, there's my wage, back to my house. Now it's six o'clock at night, and I'm like, you know what? Man, I'm kind of hungry. In fact, oh, I look in the fridge and I look in the cupboard, I don't have any food, so what do I do? I get in my van again, and where do I go? Well, I take that money, and I go to the grocery store. And there's a beautiful, huge grocery store here called Jumbo in Chile, and I go to the store, and what do I do? I buy dinner, which is a quinoa salad. I buy quinoa, I buy lettuce, I buy um, avocado, tomatoes, oh man, all of the special cucumbers and uh, mushrooms that I love to have on my salad, and what do I do? I use that money that I earned, right, during the day, and I give it to the firm, and the firm gives me its output, which is its goods and services, and what do I do? I go back home, and I eat my salad. Is that hard to understand? I don't think so. What happened? Nothing really that complicated. I got up in the morning, right? I went and worked. I was a factor production for the international school that I work at. I got paid. I got paid $100. I took my wage. I went back home. And then I was like, oh, guess what? I want to actually go 
um, buy some food. So I went there, went to the grocery store, went to Jumbo. I bought my makings for a salad, which is the output of the, of the, of the grocery store. I took my goods and services back home in my house. I made my salad, ate my dinner, and then I did what? I went to bed. Day two, what do I do? I get up in the morning and guess what? It repeats itself, of course, right? I get up in the morning, I go to school, I'm a factor of production for the firm, the international school where I work, and then I bring my money, but now I have my $100. Now let's get real, okay? What happens actually is that actually, I might not take all of that $100 home. And where, would I, where might I put that money? Well, what I could do before I got home is pass by the bank, the banking sector, and do what? Maybe I want to save some of my money every month. Maybe I'm lucky enough to be able to save 20% of my income. That would be fantastic, right? So what do I do? I take that money and I put it in my savings account, okay? Right there, $20. Wow, check it, okay? Now, where is that money? Is that money in the circular flow of income? No, <laughs> it's not, okay? So one of the things I like to tell students is like, think of this circle as like a series of pipes, right? A, a, not a series, a pipe, a circular pipe. And in that pipe, right? There's a bunch of water, boom, 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 right? And it's just flowing, 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 flowing. And then all of a sudden, instead of all of that $100 that I earn from school staying in the system, no, what actually happened is there's a leakage. And that's actually an economic term. There's a leakage right here. And $20 of that leaked out of the system and into the banking sector, which means when I go home, I only have $80, $20 dollars has leaked out of the system. That's a leakage. That is any time money is, comes out of the circular flow model and is left stagnant, in this case, in the banking sector, okay? So I, can, I go to the bank, I deposit my $20, and then I go back home, and then I'm like, you know what? I don't really feel like going out tonight. I got enough food in my, my, in my, um, in my cupboard, in my fridge, but you know what I actually want to do? Man, I need a good book. And so what do I do? I go online, and I go to amazon.com and I take my money that I earned that day and what do I do? I buy a book for $20 online with, you guessed it, Amazon, right? So what does that represent? That represents another leakage from the Chilean economy because that's where I'm earning my money and all of a sudden another $20 leaks out of the system, that's a leakage, and where does it go? It goes to the United States because Amazon is a US-based country, a US-based company, okay? So now, even though I earned $100 from my day's work, all of a sudden, we have a leakage of $20 because it's out of the flow of income. It leaked out of the pipe and it's sitting in the bank. Then I have another leakage, which is right here, of the $20 because what did I do? I imported a book from the United States. The money goes to the United States. That's a leakage, my income. Earned in dollars, I mean earned here in pesos, goes to the United States in dollars, which taps into international economics. We'll talk about that later, right? And what did I get in return? My book. Okay. So what do I do? Well, after I do that, I figuratively, because I'm online, so it's not really real anyway, right? I end up back in my household. And then I'm like, oh, geez. And imagine if this happened every single day. It doesn't. It happens like usually monthly when somebody collects their check. But remember, I have to pay taxes on my money, right? So all of a sudden, remember, or imagine that like all of a sudden, $20 of my money, I have to pay where? To the Chilean government because that's where I earn my money. So what happened at the end of that day? Wow, I actually only am at home with how much money? Well, I earned 100 minus 20 minus 20 minus my taxes, which that's total $60. So all that's left in the circular flow model is what? $40 because $20 leaked out to the banking sector, $20 leaked out to the United States in the foreign sector, and $20 leaked out to the government sector in terms of what? In terms of taxes, okay. So now we have a bunch of leakages from the system. And now here's the catch though. 
and you might have noticed, hey, check it, there are some green arrows here. <laughs> and those green arrows are actually something called injections into the system. And this works as well. Like, you know, what would you do if you added water to a pipe? You would inject water into the pipe, okay? So a leakage and an injection, if you think about this, this base um, flow of income right here, if everything were to stay flowing and not go out of the government, not, go, not leak out to the government sector, the banking sector, or the foreign sector, you would have flowing money. So when money comes into that system, guess what? Hey, that's an injection of cash or water, cash, back into the system, okay? So what would that mean? Well, let's start where we began before. Remember, I was down here and I gave the bank $20. Now, what banks do is they sell money. And the way they sell money is basically the same exact way that a pizza hut or any pizza company, or pe let's just make it pizza hut because they're all over the world. That, what do they do? They collect, they, they have a recipe for pizza and that is cheese, dough, and tomato sauce. And they buy up cheese, dough, and tomato sauce. They put it together and they sell something new called a pizza. And of course they're selling that pizza for a higher price than what it costs for them to buy the cheese, dough, and tomatoes. Banks do the exact same thing. They collect cheese, dough, and, and, and tomato sauce, but in the form of a deposit from me, Brad Kerr, right? A deposit from someone else, and a deposit from someone else of $20, and actually that would grow out to a lot of people. And then they lump that together, just like Pizza Hut makes a pizza, they take those ingredients and they put together something called a loan. And they sell the loan for a particular price, which in in banking terms, is always a percentage of the total amount of the loan. So it, it's called an interest rate. So maybe they take all of that money and they sell it for 5% more a year. So whoever takes the loan has to pay 5% more a year. But where does that money go? Does it now stay in the banking sector? No. What does it do? Well, if somebody takes a loan from the bank, what they're doing is they're actually taking the money that was mine, because banks don't keep the money there, right? Banks take a bunch of deposits, they sum it up together, they then resell that money in the form of a loan, and you have an injection of money into the system. That's pretty cool. So now my $20 has actually been re-entered into the system in the form of a loan. That's right, that's pretty cool, okay? So investment is a form of injection into the economy from the banking sector, and that's made up of a collection of smaller little chunks of money, just like pizza is made up of, you know, dough, cheese, and tomato sauce, put together into something bigger, which is a pizza, and banks take, lump, take deposits and put it into something bigger, which is called a loan, and sell it for interest. Pretty cool, okay? All right, so there's an injection of this money that was out of the system from the banking sector back into the circular flow model. All right, now what? Well, let's talk about this foreign sector. Remember, I'm in Chile, and I bought a book from Amazon, but let's say that there's a, there's a Chilena, a, a woman from Chile living in New York City, who is like, man, I, I just met this guy. He's really cool. I want to have a glass of wine with him. And so she invites him over, and that she buys the kind of wine that fills her soul, which is Chilean wine, which by the way, is the most delicious, my opinion, most delicious wine on earth. And she buys a bottle of Chilean wine in New York. Well, what did she actually do? Well, that money would be some actually money that came from the United States, came from the foreign sector and got injected where? Back into the Chilean economy in the form of an export. Now, of course, the wine's like sitting on the cub, you know, sitting on the, on the shelf of some company or some store in New York City. I get that. But just imagine if she could instantaneously like have it, you know, teleported from, from Santiago, Chile in the vineyard here to New York. That money comes to Chile. It leaves the United States and is injected into the circular flow of Chile which all of these represent domestic markets, okay? So now you have exports, that's the wine leaving, but the money is an injection into the Chilean economy. Ah, cool, so now we're like adding more money to the system when before we were just losing money. Leakages, injections, okay? So last thing, remember, I had to give up 20% of my income to the Chilean government, but what do I get in exchange, or what does the Chilean government do in exchange? It gives something called public goods 
back to, it takes my $20 and a bunch of other tax money that it collects, and it puts it back into the Chilean economy in terms of creating what? Public goods, like new roads, like new airports, like um, social programs, like they just built in my little community here, this killer new skate park. Well, where did that money come from? From my income taxes. And now all of a sudden there's a public good, it's free and kids can go learn to skateboard and it's killer. They have like great, um, you know, half pipes and these little jumps and all this amazing. And actually professional skaters from all over Chile are now coming to this little community because they built such a cool skate park. What's that? That's an example of a public good. Lighting, um, um, in some places like telecommunications, in some places water systems and electric systems, those are all public goods, okay? So the government injects those goods back into the economy and it's actually injecting the money. Think about it too, because in order to build the skate park, what do they have to do? Well, they had to hire workers in order to do it, okay? So those are all injections into the economy, okay? The last little thing over here, this is pretty easy, like all firms pay taxes as well and from there comes public goods. So, you know, this money coming from me on my income and a public good is analogous to a firm, like say this grocery store, Jumbo, who makes profits has to pay taxes on their profits and then from there come public goods. Okay, so there it is. Like, take a look at that. Like if you were looking down on Chile and looking at all of that stuff, my gosh, like that's, that's the whole deal. That is all of the economic activity going on in a particular place. And what your task now is to do is to understand how that flows. You should be able to retell that story, but also you need to know the terms of wages and rent and land, labor, capital, resource market, factors of production, and all these things. And you can find that information in the notes that are associated with um, this video, okay? So, so rather than go through all of that, I think it's most important for you to understand the overall concept. This, this right here, by the way, all of this economic activity is going to build into something called aggregate demand. Because at every level of this, at every level of the store I just told you, people are buying things, buying things, buying things, buying things, buying things, right? And the government, you know, there, there's imports, there's exports. The government was taking in income and it was creating public goods and banks were taking in savings and creating investments. And so there's this natural flow of things. But actually right here, as you will see, as we get towards aggregate demand and gross domestic product, you're gonna see that right here are all of the components of aggregate demand, which are consumption, investment, government spending, and actually the foreign sector over there is imports minus exports or net exports. And so all of the basic understanding of macroeconomics is right in this particular diagram. It's super cool. All right, my friends, if you don't understand that, go back and watch this because this will create the framework upon which all of macroeconomics makes sense. All right, my friends, we're rolling on to the next video.